Good afternoon, Facebook, and welcome to the Mississippi State Conference of the NAACP's Conversations with Dr. Justin Turner today. And we know Dr. Turner is a very busy man. However, we know in the midst of this pandemic and public health crisis, there are a lot of questions that you have and we wanna give you some answers and we wanna bring it to you from a person who works in the field, who deals with it every day and who has the credentials to be able to give you information that you can trust. So just a little bit of background. First of all, I'm Sandra Carmelvin and I am the health committee chairman for the Mississippi State Conference of the NAACP. And I wanna welcome everyone to this conversation that we're, we're about to have with Dr. Turner. So just to lay the context of what we're dealing with right now. Today, as we speak, we have over a million cases of COVID-19 in the United States and 75,000 deaths, well, over 75,000 deaths. And those are the deaths that have been counted and documented. So uh, as an epidemiologist, I'll just say that I'm sure that the cases and death rates are more than that. Uh, today in Mississippi, we know that we have 9,090 cases of COVID-19 in the state that have been documented and 409 deaths. Uh, and, 400 of, and four of those cases uh, were discovered today or reported today, and we had 13 deaths. So with that, and to lay, after laying the context, I do want to talk to Dr. Turner to ask some questions, allow you to ask questions of him about COVID-19. So just to tell you a little bit about Dr. Turner, we're extremely honored to have him uh, give us some of his time today to address this issue and to answer your questions. Dr. Turner is the CEO of Turner Care, LLC, and he serves as medical director of Specialty Hospice Agency. He received his undergraduate degree from the Jackson State University and graduated from Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee. He completed his residency at the Mississippi Medical Center, which is located right here in the heart of Jackson. And in addition to his already busy practice, he's also been recognized for several awards. He's been recognized as 2019 Chief of Medicine, uh, at St. Dominic's, 2018 Best Doctor of Jackson by the Jackson Free P Press, 2018 Top Entrepreneur in Mississippi by the Mississippi Business Journal, 2017 Doctor of Distinction from Mississippi State Medical Association, 2016 Young Physician Award by the Mississippi Medical and Surgical Association, 2015 Top 50 Under 40 Business Persons in Mississippi by the Mississippi Business Journal. 2014 Mississippi Healthcare Hero, uh, and 2013 Young Influential of Jackson, and 2012 Newcomer Physician of the Year. And if that is not enough, Dr. Turner also currently serves on the COVID-19 Task Force for the Mississippi State Medical Association and Mayor Lumumba and the City of Jackson Subcommittee to address COVID-19 and health disparities in Blacks and the Subcommittee to address COVID-19 and mental health. And why is all that important? Because every time we talk about COVID-19, we wanna know what the person's credentials are. So I've given you the credentials so that you know he has the knowledge, he has the training and what he says, you can at least halfway think is correct. So with that, I'm gonna stop. I am gonna lay the groundwork and start the conversation with a question for Dr. Turner. And then we're gonna just be fluid with this conversation. Uh, as it goes and at, wherever it takes us, we will, um, go in that direction. So uh, Dr. Turner, my first question for you is, is COVID-19 just another flu? All right, well, first of all, I wanna say Dr. Melvin, thanks so much for the invitation to be able to uh, speak alongside such an awesome hostess. Um, you know, we, re we really appreciate all the work that you do uh, on behalf of uh, the state and NAACP. Uh, so to answer your question, you asked is COVID-19, you know, like the flu? While there are some similarities between COVID-19 and the flu, these are two totally separate entities. They both belong to the virus family, but uh, COVID-19 uh, is totally new, which is why we call it COVID-19. Mm -hmm. uh, COVID comes from the parent name coronavirus, which has actually been around for quite some time. If you look at the back of a Lysol bottle, you see the word coronavirus actually on there. So most of us at some point in time have actually had 
what the back of the Lysol bottle is referring to as coronavirus because it's a type of a common cold, all right? It just so happened that in 2019, we found out about this new particular strain, which is called COVID-19, which is thought to have originated um, back in China. Similarities between that and the flu include, you know, sometimes you can both have cough, you can have fever, you can have shortness of breath for both of these particular conditions. But we're finding out with COVID-19, some patients are having very, very distinct symptoms. I had a patient a couple of weeks ago who had lost the smell. And I've taken care of a lot of flu patients in the time that I've been a doctor, which is since 2008 when I graduated from Harry. Um, but I've never had someone to show up with the flu who had lost the smell. And this thing is so new that we're finding out more and more information, it seems, every day. As far as the, um, there's also something called a reproductive number, which is higher in COVID-19. So this has to do with taking a group of 100 people, putting one person in it, and looking at the ability to infect everyone else in it. And this number start to be way, way higher compared to someone who has the flu. Why is that important? That's important because you, know, you, you, you're hearing everyone talk about these sheltered home practices. You're hearing everyone talk about stay at home, practice social distancing. Why is that important? You know, it's like, man, you know, flu's been a while. You know, we had to talk about that because this thing is so infected. Mm -hmm. With the flu, you have what we call an incubation period, which is the time between which a person gets exposed to the condition and they begin to have symptoms where in the flu, you know, you're talking about something that happens over the course of a few days, whereas in COVID-19, you can get exposed to someone who has uh, COVID-19 and you may not show any symptoms for 10 to 11, all the way up to 14 days. So those are some of the distinctions between COVID-19 and the flu, but to someone thinking that, hey, you know, this is just like the flu, no, two totally different things. Okay, and I, I didn't even remember seeing coronavirus on the Lysol bottle, but now that you pointed that out, that's true. So it's been around, and I guess that's the novel part of it. Yes. Uh, it's just a new version of it. Um, what about how deadly the COVID-19 uh, virus is compared to the flu? I know a lot of people say, well, 23,000 people died of the flu. What's the big deal? A lot of people die of the flu. Is, is it a big deal? Um, it's a huge deal. And the reason why it's such a huge deal, uh, people do die from the flu. Uh, people do die from COVID-19. We have seen more and more people die from COVID-19 since we uh, just first started realizing how serious this was within the last couple of months. But one thing that distinguishes the flu from COVID-19 is we actually have um, promise with some medications that have thought to have been helpful, such as Tamiflu, which a lot of us are familiar with. If we've gone to the doctor and we've been diagnosed with the flu or our kids have been diagnosed with the flu, they get Tamiflu. Now, is Tamiflu a cure for the flu? No, it's not. But studies do show that if you take this within the first 48 hours of having symptoms, your, your disease courses start to be less mm -hmm. and you have a, a better chance of being able to survive it. Compared to COVID-19, we don't have any medicines right now that have any conclusive evidence-based signs to suggest that it works. So yes, uh, both conditions are deadly, but in my own practice at Turner Care, most of the patients who got the flu shot this particular, this particular flu season have either not gotten the flu compared to previous years, or if they did get the flu, their symptoms were so, so minor that they recovered within a day or so. Whereas my patients who did not get the flu vaccine or did not take Tamiflu, those patients had symptoms that lasted way, way long. Okay, okay. So what about the idea that the, the COVID-19 only affects the old? Should people who are under 60 or 50 be worried about the uh, COVID-19? So doctor, that's a great question. So, you know, we, we kind of compare and contrast the flu. One thing specific about the flu is it definitely can affect people that's older, but it also can affect people that's uh, um, younger, it can impact, impact pregnant women as well. Well, mm -hmm. with COVID-19, initially when it first came out, we had limitations on testing. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't get tested unless you met one of these criteria. So it was basically you had to be older than 65. You had to have a immunocompromised condition. Now, for those uh, listening audience that may not understand what immunocompromise mean. It basically has to do with having an immune system, which is part of your body that helps to fight away disease and stuff like that. Compromise meaning that there's disruption in it, meaning that it doesn't work as well compared to someone else. What are some of those conditions? Well, someone who may have 
some type of autoimmune condition such as lupus, someone who may actually have some type of cancer, AIDS. Now we're finding these other conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, obesity, mm -hmm. that are putting patients at high risk. So if you have an immunocompromised condition. Thirdly, if you're pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, so these were three different you know, areas. And then fourthly, if you were a healthcare worker and you was exposed. So mm -hmm. who can this affect? It can affect anybody that has lungs, anybody mm -hmm. that's breathing, anybody that's breathing, you can be affected by this. When, we, when it first came out, Doc, a lot of people was thinking, okay, I'm 18 years old or I'm 30. So this is not something that's probably gonna affect me too much. So I'm not worried about social distancing. I'm gonna have a party at the house and I'm gonna turn up. It's my birthday. I had planned to go to the beach in Florida back in January. I've already booked my reservations. You know, they're sending me messages like, Doc, can I still go and turn up? You know, turn down for what? Turn down so you can live. <laughs> so anybody who's breathing, can actually get this. And we need to drive home that message. Like no one is any respect of a person. This virus don't care if you're black. It doesn't care if you're white. It don't care if you're young. It don't care if you're old. It don't care if you're pregnant. It don't care if you're rich, high class, low class, any type of class. This virus is serious. And we need to know that anybody that has a pair of lungs, which is anybody that's watching this right now, can get COVID-19. Thank you for that. Now, I've also, I follow you on Facebook, and I know that you've been pretty successful in treating a couple of your patients that you've had with it. Do you have a special regimen? How do you, um, what do you recommend for your patients? Okay. Other than coming to Turner Care. <laughs> but, but, you know. Outside of Turner Care, look, I wish I could invite every particular uh, Mississippian to Turner Care, but that's just not the reality of the matter. Mm -hmm. uh, let me find some wood. Uh, hold on. Okay. So as of right now, every patient that has come to Turner Care and every patient who's been diagnosed with COVID-19 under Turner Care has survived. We've had a 100% recovery. We have not had one death due to anybody um, having COVID-19. Now, does that mean that no one can possibly die from it over the next few weeks? No, it does not mean that. Mm -hmm. But data is something that can tell the truth. People can lie, but numbers don't. Right. So what we're doing differently that distinguishes Turner Care, maybe from some other places. So before COVID-19 even existed, what Turner Care tries to do is embedded within our approach, which is treating the whole person, focusing on mind, body, and spirit, but more so being proactive and not being reactive. Mm -hmm. So I have one patient who was diagnosed with COVID-19 back in late March, and I diagnosed him. He had lost of smell. He had some fevers and stuff like that. Um, I got him treated. Uh, we got on zinc, 25 milligrams once a day. We got some vitamin C, at least 100 uh, units of, of it. Um, and he was already, he was already taking vitamin D, 50,000 units once a week. That's kind of like my main three. There are also some other things such as echinacea and elderberry that, that he's taking as well. And I do recommend that. But those are my COVID-19, you know, survivor kit. He got better within 48 hours and he had no symptoms the rest of the time that he quarantined. So mm -hmm. all of my patients are getting their regimen who have COVID-19, but listen to what I said, he was already taking vitamin D. Wow. So most of our patients, I test them for vitamin D um, and their levels are low. I would say more than 95% of my patients, doc, who I test a vitamin D level on is normal and, and the patient tells me that they never had it tested before. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, we also do a screening exam at Turner Care where we can pick up on disease before it starts. Mm -hmm. So this particular patient has something called insulin resistance, which is something that mm -hmm. predates diabetes by several years. Mm -hmm. I found out this, this particular patient had this last year. So once we found out, now his numbers didn't show diabetes, but it showed he had a precursor to it. We mm -hmm. made the adjustments. He cut back meat. He didn't do meat for a month. Um, he cut back the carbs. He cut back the breads. We, we developed a specific uh, meal plan. Uh, he lost about 25 pounds. I repeated that same test, and it showed that his insulin resistance level went from abnormal to normal. So what does that mean? Mm -hmm. It means that by the time he was diagnosed with COVID-19, he had already put himself in a better chance at having a stronger immune system, right. not having diabetes, and being at a place where he could be able to deal with this better. So we're hearing that 90% of the people that's in the hospital, y'all listen up, 90% of the people who are in the hospital with COVID-19 has at least one underlying health condition. Mm -hmm. Just because you got a health condition doesn't mean the health condition has to have you. 
Well said, well said. And I think it's really important. And that point that you drove to the deaths, if you look at the numbers, these people have a comorbidity. So the fact that you were able to work with the patient before they got diagnosed with COVID-19 and put them in a better, a better position, that lets us know that in thinking about strategies, we need to think about um, how to address those comorbidities as well before you actually get exposed to, to COVID-19 or anything else because it just immunocompromises you when you have those things. Um, I want you to touch on a thing that we talked about yesterday and that's this concept that hospitals are being paid more to list COVID-19 as a cause of death. Um, that's a really, really great question. I'm glad that you, you brought that up. Um, let's go back. So in, in America, we have less than 9% of people who do not have insurance at all. We also understand that the number one cause of bankruptcy in America is actually medical bills. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We also understand that we have a record number of people who are filing for unemployment. So there's a huge economic challenge for our hospital systems to be able to deal with the uncertainty of COVID-19. Right now, in 2020, if someone comes into the hospital, they have a associated respiratory disease, the hospital typically gets a reimbursement from Medicare for approximately $5,000, $5,000. You come in, you have mild illness and you have some other you know, things that happen, typically about $5,000. Well, what, what we have been experiencing with COVID-19 is patients being in the hospital for not just two or three days, but 30 days, 45 days, mm -hmm. which basically require a whole lot more resources than the average patient who comes in with a respiratory disease. If it turns out that this patient needs to be on a ventilator, doc, that basically is extending that care well beyond the typical time frame as well. Right. But you have... Uh, several different doctors that are seeing the patient because now you got you got your respiratory system that's involved, you got your respiratory therapist you got to pay, you got your ICU doctor you got to pay, you got all this equipment that you're taking off every day and every night because you got to have new equipment each time. And we heard about the PPP shortage, so that's personal protective uh, protection. So all that being said, it takes more to take care of a COVID-19 patient than it does for a regular patient. Right. We had the CARES Act which, which the government, you know, allotted all of these funds to be able to help out uh, with hospitals that may need it, you know, financial assistance because they have to be able to take care of those patients. Well, for a COVID-19 patient, they allocated more funds for those compared to a regular respiratory illness. So a mild, you know, kind of uncomplicated course or less complicated course pays about $13,000. So yes, the hospitals are being paid more for a COVID-19 patient compared to someone who may have a respiratory illness or pneumonia that we may not know the origin of it. So if you find out specifically that someone has COVID-19 and that's listed, you do get more. If that patient has to be on a ventilator, the re reimbursements we're looking at about $30,000. Mm -hmm. What you don't want is a system where the hospital system is being overwhelmed and they cannot afford to pay the necessary personnel to be able to handle it. If you think about Mississippi and you look at North Mississippi where we've had hospitals to close down, they had to close down because they didn't have great doctors. They closed down because they didn't have the financial support. Right. Okay. Because we know it's not an issue of uh, 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 um, availability. It's not an issue of patients not needing help up there. So, you know, we're dealing with that crisis right now. And it just so happened that COVID-19 is exposing it even more. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. So a lot of people are thinking, okay, you know, you know, this is a big myth. This is a big conspiracy. Hospitals are being paid more to list COVID-19. Yes, they're being paid more. But be careful listening to outsiders and listening to your Facebook experts and self-proclaimed PhDs without getting the context of where it's coming from. Right, right. And that whole idea that a lot of people who are insured are insured because they have jobs that pay part of the cost of insurance. And now that you have more people who are unemployed, that insurance leaves with the employment. So now you have more people who do not have insurance that are needing uh, to access the healthcare system too. Right. Um, so we, got, we do have a couple of questions and I want to make sure before we run out of time that we get some. Okay. Uh, one question is, how do you feel about reopening Mississippi? <laughs> 
So uh, I just got off a task force meeting with uh, Mayor Lubamba in the city of Jackson, and I have one at five o'clock with our state medical association, which reports directly to the governor. Okay. Um, how do I feel? Well, if I had to answer that question, Doc, based upon signs, just signs, I would say that um, it's too early for us to reopen uh, Mississippi. But we understand that we live in a time where there's uh, economic uncertainty, there's political pressure, uh, there's lack of uniformity between mm -hmm. maybe all municipalities throughout the state. So this city is doing this, this city is doing that. Right. Um, here in Jackson, we have a limitations on restaurants being able to uh, take care of customers inside. Mm -hmm. Whereas there are some other places in the greater Jackson area that are open. Mm -hmm. um, and we do care about the financial health and well-being of our business owners that's in Jackson. Because we understand mm -hmm. that um, if Jackson is closed, you know, for a certain period of time, people are just going to go elsewhere, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then when it's time to reopen, your staff probably have taken jobs elsewhere. Right. So I think that it's too early based on signs. But given everything else that serves as factors, um, there's financial suicide that can happen to people as, as well. And we are a vulnerable population in the black community. So it's time for us to, re and, I'm, and I'm choosing my words carefully, it's time for us to reopen, but we have to do it safely and we have to do it in phases and we have to do it with really, really strict precautions. So that's what our task force meeting was about today. How do we reopen things, but we do it as safely as possible? Okay, and I think that's a fair, um assessment of where we are. We have to open at some point. We just want to make sure that when we open, we don't have to close back because we have done it too soon or that we aren't prepared for what we know could potentially happen when we reopen. But I, I agree with the fact that um, you have to offset the personal things that's, that go on with the financial things that go on. But that's also the nature of public health. How yeah. far is... Um, at what point do you infringe on a person's individual rights in the interest of public health? Right. So that's the question as public health practitioners we always deal with. Um, another question is, once you have the virus and beat it, can you test positive a second time? Well, before we answer, can you test positive a second time? Let's talk about testing positive the first time. Okay. Because of the way uh, RNA and this particular um, um, disease where these particles exist, you can actually test positive for four weeks later, five weeks later, six weeks later, based upon the first test. So just because you test positive doesn't mean that you are currently infectious. Okay, so I want to point that out. And that's one reason why we're not testing everyone who have tested positive before, because you never want to get a result of a test that you don't know what to do with. Uh -huh. Because if I have COVID-19 and I quarantine and I'm better after five days and my dentist tells me that he wants a COVID-19 that's negative before I go in and I get to test three weeks later. And although I, I've been fine for two whole weeks, he tells me that I can't get this cavity fixed that's, that's keeping me up at night because I hadn't tested negative. So right now, your first positive test can't stay positive for several weeks now. If you tested positive and you've got better and, and let's say that, you know, you had a repeat test that was negative, can you get another uh, test? Basically, can you have a reinfection? Yes, you can have a reinfection. And there are studies showing where people in China who have been reinfected. But I will tell you that the hope is that after you was diagnosed with COVID-19 the first time, that your body has built up some sense of immunity and you're less likely to be infected if you get exposed to someone the second time. Okay, okay. So it's a more reduced, maybe, response if right. you're reinfected? Exactly. OK. okay. Um, so this one, I think I'm going to ask it uh, because you know we had some controversy after our president made the comment about the injecting bleach and Lysol and things like that. So um, give us your. Uh, Tell us can, about your thoughts about injecting, swallowing, bathing, or rubbing bleach, disinfectants, rubbing alcohol on your body. How effective is that <laughs> in addressing COVID-19 or keeping yourself uh, safe from it? 15. 
<laughs> it's about as effective as draining blood from a turnip. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so unfortunately, um, we did have someone to make that statement and we saw an uptick in calls to poison control centers and stuff like that. It's not safe at all. Please, please don't do that. Please don't do that. Okay, I just wanted you to say that because yeah. it seems a little bit ridiculous, but since we are just making sure we clarify things, yes. I thought it might be good to say that. Yes. Um, how would you, and I think this may be the last, well, we have do have a question. Let me go to the question. Um, how would you go about visiting family during COVID-19? Okay, so visiting family during COVID-19, and I'll try to make it quick. If you're visiting a family, understand that your family is not any respect of a person compared to anybody else. Sometimes we kind of let our guard down around family because it's family, okay? Mm -hmm. But remember that you can be asymptomatic, meaning that you have no symptoms at all and you can be spreading this, okay? We actually think the majority of the cases that we're having and the amount of people that's been affected is from people who don't have any symptoms at all, all okay. right? So if you go around family, we still asking that you wear a mask and understand that the mask is not necessarily to protect you as much as it is to protect the people around you. So if you go around family, we still recommend to wear a mask. We still recommend minimizing gatherings. Right now, the recommendation is no more than 10 people inside mm -hmm. because there have been people who've gone to a funeral service mm -hmm. where there was more than 20 something people and at least seven members of that particular family died. Yeah. So this thing is real. So we still want you to visit family. Mother's Day is coming up. If you can go and visit mom, go and visit mom. But we want you to do that safely and not go there and mom is fine and you leave and now she got COVID-19 because you had it and you did not wear a mask and you gave it to her. I think that's, that's, that's a great message. The last one is for you. And that is, how can I sign up for telehealth visits? Do you do telehealth at Turner Care? And how could a person, if they needed a telehealth visit, what would they need to do? Yeah, so you can sign up for telehealth by basically calling us, calling our regular office number. And this is something that we recommend and all doctors doing in Mississippi. Um, if you can, it's the preferred method. Listen, you don't want to show up at a doctor's office and be in a lobby with some other people who got it and you don't know. It. So um, our office number is 601-398-2335. Um, you can email us at uh, Turner Care, and that's T-U-R-N-E-R-C-A-R-E-M-S at gmail.com and we can get you signed up and um man all you need is a telephone and we'll make it happen we've been able to get the insurance companies to agree to um, approving for most telemedicine visits even if you don't have the capable uh, technology to do a video conference like we're doing now okay well dr turner i know that you have some other obligations a little bit later but is there anything that you like any message you would like to leave with the audience before we um close out yeah i just just want our listen audience to know you know real short we will get through this this is temporary this is temporary but the time it takes for us to get through it is based upon what you do what i do and everyone else does as a result of these recommendations that we're leaving just because the state is open back up doesn't mean that you have to go back inside the restaurants. It doesn't mean that you have to do everything else that everyone else is doing. But we do understand that financially, people have to survive, okay? Uh, I want to watch football this season just like you. I'm a Laker fan. Mm -hmm. I want to watch the Laker playoffs. We should be in the finals right now. Nonetheless, we have to do what's safe. So I want to encourage everyone to please, please, please take this serious. Don't think that the absence of symptoms means the absence of disease. We call high blood pressure the silent killer for a reason. Same thing with COVID-19. You could be walking around, not have any symptoms at all, and you can have it. If you have any symptoms at all, call your doctor ASAP. Stop posting on social media, hey, I got this going on, what y'all think? That's not your doctor. Call your doctor. If you don't have a primary care doctor, we'll take you. <laughs> Everyone needs to have one. And to the people in, in my black community, and I preface this with saying that we love all people. I have patients from all different ethnicities. We're struggling right now as a community. And I'm working really, really hard. Doc is working really, really hard on behalf of the black community. I told the governor and leaders that we have to take a short-term 
approach right now. We also have to take a long-term approach at being able to get rid of these health disparities that have been plaguing us since the HIV AIDS epidemic. This is not new about blacks being disproportionately affected. Mm -hmm. But now that it's being brought to the surface, what are we going to do about it? Okay. So you take your health serious is something we're asking you to do, but get prepared so we can do some community organizing and we can carry on with the mission of the NAACP and doing what's best for the least of these as well. Thank you so much for that. And as we wrap up, I just want to let you all know that these conversations with Dr. Justin Turner of Turner Care LLC have been brought to you by the Mississippi State Conference of the NAACP and hosted by the Health Committee. I'm the Health uh, Committee Chairperson, Sandra Melvin. And if you have any questions for the NAACP, any community concerns, health related, please uh, feel free to send me an email at scarr1608 at gmail.com. And with that, everyone be safe, practice social distancing, and take care. Until the next time.